Welcome to Rogue Trader. Please read the disclaimer and remember that prices can go down as well as up. Hello and welcome to another Rogue Trader video. And today I'm taking a look at Shell PLC. Shell is the world's fourth largest oil company. And to give you some context, Total Energies, who I last did a video on, are number five, and BP are number 12 in terms of market cap. Now, for many years, Shell were a Anglo-Dutch enterprise but only this year they've actually become a UK only entity and they used to have this complicated A and B series shares so it made it kind of a bit difficult working out how to invest in them and they've streamlined that down into just one line of shares. They boasted 40 billion of free cash flow in 2021 but are paying a pathetic 3% dividend yield. They had minimal Russian exposure, which actually makes them the best oil stock to invest in by default in the UK. And I've found that their profits are particularly influenced by refining margins, which just doubled in the first quarter this year. 48% of their profits are from upstream, with oil products accounting for 13% of their profits. 7% of their profits comes from chemicals, and integrated gas, which is liquefied natural gas and renewables, account for 32%, although renewables is only a tiny proportion of that. So they finally came up with a long-term strategy, which they called the which they call the Powering Progress Strategy, which came forward last year. But actually it's not really very much of a strategy. I mean, all they're doing is maintaining their current assets, apart from dropping oil production by 15% by 2030. So from their 40 billion of free cash flow in 2021, about half of that goes towards this powering progress investment plan, which is, as I say, just, just actually just dropping their oil production. And then a quarter is their second is their second priority which is returning 20 to 30 percent to shareholders and then there's lower priority aims for their strategy is they any extra money they have they use to accelerate the process of achieving net zero by 2030 and then and after that priority their fourth priority is to reduce debt their headline objective is to be net zero by 2030. And this actually was to be, uh, originally that was going to be 2050. But after after Friends of the Earth took them to court and won, the court, the Dutch courts forced them to, uh, to change that to 2030. So here again is their revenues by business segment. I've already described what goes into each of these uh, segments. Uh, but what's interesting is that 80% of their upstream sales are inter-segment sales. So that's essentially them selling crude oil to themselves to then refine into final oil products. And this sets Shell apart a bit from their peers. So Total Energies, for example, a lot more of their oil that they produce, they sell to other people. Shell, on the other hand, they don't actually trade much oil most of the oil they produce they then refine themselves and so a lot of their revenues are from selling refined oil products both to their own service stations and then to other people however when we look at the profit by business segment 48 percent of their profits were actually from selling crude oil whereas only 13 percent of their profits were from oil products and this is explained by in around the year 2020 and 2021, there were historically low refining margins. So that's why the oil products didn't make up much of their actual profits, even though that's where their business is focused. And this, this becomes very important when I go into detail in this later on. They produce a fairly steady 7% profit from their chemical, from their petrochemicals business and integrated gas and renewables, which includes obviously uh, LNG, which is very, very important at the moment, is 32% of their profit by business segment. According to my very rough estimate, about 10% of these revenues are going to be affected by their connection to Russia. 
but I still think that Shell are the best company to invest in if you're worried about Russia because the impact on Shell is actually fairly negligible compared with the other oil stocks you can invest in, in the UK. Now the most important thing really if you're investing in Shell is the do you think the price of oil is going to stay elevated in coming years here's the price of oil over the last eight years or so and we see that we are now in a energy crisis situation um but you've really got to believe that this is going to continue and that there'll be continually high oil prices in the coming years now if you go onto my channel and look at the commodities video i did you see there I explain in quite a bit of detail why I think we are going to have high oil prices in the next few years. Also, you should take a look at my Greta Gold video I did. And in summary, around 2019, 2020, the Western governments all decided that they were going to go all in on renewable energy, on, be on building windmills and solar power in order to power our countries with green energy because they decided that oil and gas and fossil fuels were evil. The UK government vouched a trillion of spending into that. The EU also said they were going to spend a trillion on it. And Joe Biden has said he'd spend 1.7 trillion over 10 years. And with a clap of a hand, the, the Western governments really went all in on on green energy and uh, fossil fuels became an evil monster that everyone wanted no nothing to do with. It was interesting because we saw a rush of money into these renewable stocks and that correlated with a drop in the price of oil stocks. But the problem is that even if you look at the data from left-leaning sources like the International Energy Agency, we see that oil, oil demand is forecast to actually increase in the coming years, not decrease. So we've got this classic supply crunch situation where the amount of oil being produced has been falling whereas the actual demand for this oil is increasing and this was the case even before the ukraine war but then of course the war in ukraine has only made that worse and looking at the uh the, looking at the price of oil here i really do believe that the thesis which i summarized in these in my greta gold video last year and in the commodities update i did I do believe that this has been proven true and that we are in a long-term energy crisis and we can expect elevated oil prices for quite a few numbers of number of years. So that's the central plank to why I'm interested in investing in oil stocks. And uh, but but to be sure, if, before you invest in Shell, you've got to be very certain yourself that you believe that we're going to have higher oil prices for quite a few number of years. The big caveat to that is that if there's a massive global collapse, economic collapse, then that will actually bring oil prices shooting down. Here I've plotted Shell's sales up against the Brent crude price and gas prices. And actually, disappointingly, even though we've got record Brent crude prices, these sales haven't actually gone up so much. And I've established that that's mostly because of refining margins. Most of the oil that Shell produced, they sell to themselves. And then a lot of their revenues comes actually from uh, selling refined products. So because refining margins were low in 20 and 21, that's why the uptick isn't so great as you'd expect looking at the oil price. Having said that, they've still done okay because because gap, gas prices shot up and that's a third of their profits plus of course they do sell some oil so they do benefit anyway from the from the high oil prices but still the the particular focus that shell have on selling refined products versus the other oil companies explains why it's only a dip up and why it's not gone right up to uh to where it was before COVID in terms of their sales. Here we've got the Shell share price against Brent crude. 
And you can see that there is a good correlation, particularly recently, between the increase in crude prices and increase in Shell share price. And here we have the Shell share price versus UK gas prices. And although the UK gas prices have, of course, been going down a lot just recently, they're still orders of magnitudes higher than they were before 2021. And you can see how the, you know, compared with when I compare against crude price, the gas prices have completely run away from, uh, so that at the same scale, the, uh, the shell price here is just like a line, flat line on the bottom. So, you know, this is really good for a company that is selling a lot of gas. So looking historically, in 2018, Shell completed a 30 billion divestment program. So they'd actually been selling off a lot of their oil and gas assets to become a smaller company in a run up to 2018, as highlighted by selling a three billions worth of Canadian natural gas resources here. When we look at the size of Shell, in relation to their UK listed peers, um, like BP here down at number 12 with less than half the market cap, you know, it does kind of make sense in a way for them to uh, downsize a bit, given all the concerns back then. But they're still a fairly large company by default in terms of their oil and gas. Now, in 2018, they, annu they announced a 25 billion share buyback program to 2020 and that was obviously a bit of a dumb decision because look at how high the share price was then compared with since 2020 so it was a bit stupid doing a share buyback at this time however they made up for that by announcing a final investment decision in 2018 on a big liquefied natural gas project in canada in 2019 and 2020, they didn't really do much. We had the corona crash, and that obviously sent the, uh, the share price down a lot. Now, in 2020, though, as part of all the whole uh, COVID crisis, they decided to rebase their dividend, and that's why they've only got a pathetic 3% dividend that they're paying out. But that kind of looks like a knee-jerk action, actually, now. So, yeah, you know, generally, it's kind of not a very inspiring management record to be honest however in 2021 they finally came up with a strategy document which is this powering progress strategy to be honest like i said it's not really much of a strategy i mean all they're doing is reducing their oil and gas by 15 percent, and that's about it frankly um, and what they are putting into renewables as we'll go into later isn't very much now then only like a month after that they lost in a dutch court ruling which uh, where friends of the earth had took them to court splitting hairs over this uh, fact that they wanted to be net zero by 2050 and friends of the earth well done managed to force them to become net zero by 2030. now shell challenged that in court and, but have said that they're going to become net zero by 2030 anyway. All that does, is it means they need to spend a bit more money on becoming net zero. But it doesn't really have any overall uh, big impact on their profitability or on the amount of carbon that gets burnt actually either. Because that number doesn't include the uh you know the the carbon that's put into the atmosphere from the oil that they sell so a load of theatrics but actually one good thing that came out of it perhaps is that they perhaps almost as punishment for this i'm sure it wasn't but um that's how i like to think about it um shell decided to wave goodbye to the netherlands and they're now in terms of their management they're now a completely UK domiciled company and um, they renamed themselves to Shell PLC they used to be Royal Dutch Shell and now they're Shell PLC and they're now fully a British company and they've got a simplified share structure 
listed on the FTSE stock exchange. There's two more big ticket items for 2021. One is they sold their Permian Shell assets to Conoco Phillips for 9.5 billion. So that's a lot of uh, gas assets, but they are shale assets. And you know, even I don't really like shale, as uh, you know, that much to be honest. Um, and and an interesting thing that happened in 2021 was this uh, third point letter. So this was a letter from a hedge fund which had some interesting insights. So in their letter, they announced that they had been opened to big position into Shell. And they say the following, the past two years have been especially challenging for Shell shareholders due to a major dividend cut and well-publicized court case that ordered changes to Shell's business model. Stepping further back, it has been a difficult two decades for shareholders with annualized stock returns of just 3% and decreasing returns on invested capital. However, despite the current sour sentiment, we see opportunity for improvement across the board at Shell. Shell is one of the cheapest large cap stocks in the world, trading at under four times next year's EBITDA and eight times earnings at strip prices. It also trades at a 35% discount on most metrics to peers ExxonMobil and Chevron, despite Shell's higher quality and more sustainable business mix. Compared to its peers, Shell generates a much larger percentage of its cash from flow and earnings from stable businesses that have major role to play in the energy transition. For example, Shell is the largest global player in liquefied natural gas, which is a crucial transition fuel to move off carbon intensive coal fired power generation. In 2022, we expect the company's energy transition business to generate a bit of over 25 billion with sustaining capex of only 5 billion. These businesses account for just over 40% of Shell's EBITDA, but would likely support Shell's entire enterprise value if they were a standalone company. At the current share price, we believe investors are getting the remaining 60% of EBITDA for free. You know, so there's like a very interesting uh, investment case for Shell from this hedge fund. Uh, in its you know in its own right um it's like a different aspect to the to my investment cases that I, i'm putting forward from a different angle they also say in our view shell has too many competing stakeholders pushing it in too many different directions resulting in an incoherent conflicting set of strategies attempting to appease multiple interests but, but satisfying none and that's a good insight in their history. Um, and my my own view of them when I look back is that they've been, you know, they're a huge company with a kind of conservative management, which has been bumbling along, unable to form the company into a, a good new strategy. But in the end, despite bumbling along, and not really having any strategy apart from just reducing their oil by 15%. What that's left with them by default, by, by doing nothing, is a company that is just by accident in the best situation of all the oil stocks. You know, BP, BP for example, have had a much more extreme strategy um, of going into green and, and destroying their oil infrastructure. And... They've been running around with ants in their pants. And uh, now that they've just lost half their oil assets, thanks to the Ukraine invasion, they're completely screwed as a company. So so just by default, by, by doing nothing, I feel that Shell are actually in the best position. So to just focus on Russia, um, Shell have said that they're going to stop buying crude on the open market and remove Russian volumes from their supply chain 
and and shut all of their Russian service stations. So I've listed here exactly what Shell's business interests were, but actually the impact on Shell is actually quite minimal compared with the other oil majors. So of Shell's hydrocarbon reserves, only 8% of them are stained by Russian blood, whereas for total energies, it's 20% and BP, a whopping 50% of BP's hydrocarbon reserves are Russian. So actually, in terms of the hydrocarbon reserves, when you take away the Russia, Shell have about the same hydrocarbon reserves as Total Energy and BP. They're all kind of even Stevens now. And in terms of directly owned companies and equities, um, that's only 5 billion in the case of Shell, which is only 2% of their market cap. So whereas for total energies, it's a bit of a curveball. And BP, I mean, it's a horrendous crisis at BP. Actually, Shell are not really, not really exposed to Russia much at all. And so in terms of Russia, Shell are clearly by default the best company to invest in. I actually invested in BP last year and then sold up here and then to buy down here actually into Shell and Total Energies. You can go you can go and see my original video I did on BP and then the video I did here, which then led to me selling BP because because I was worried about the Russian invasion. And I find it incredible that BP are trading up here. You know, you know, Shell are up, total energies are up, but I find it totally inconceivable why BP are trading up here when they've just been cut in half by the Russian invasion. You know, half their hydrocarbon reserves are Russian related. 35% of their market cap is directly invested in Russia. I find the BP share price a total mispricing. So now I'm going to go and look at all the individual business segments and starting integrated gas and renewables. So this is their natural gas exploration, production and sales and liquid natural gas production and sales plus renewables. Now, when you look at the renewables component of Shell, it really is laughable. It's nothing. You know, they really are not there at all when you compare them to BP and Total Energies. Again, I did a video on Total Energy, which you can look at, but they had their strategy set back in 2017, which included renewables, and look at where they are now. Shell are nowhere in terms of renewables. But you could actually say that, again, by default, they're in the best place just from doing nothing. Importantly, renewables is a minor impact on their revenues. This is all from gas and particularly from liquefied natural gas. Their actual hydrocarbon production is kind of flatlined. Maybe the gas is down. We know they've been selling a lot of their gas assets and their liquefied natural gas sales kind of level overall. Here's all the big ticket items that I list. You, you can uh, print screen if you want to go into that. But in summary, the renewables is ramping up, but Shell is still the poor relation versus competitors in terms of renewables. And I describe their gas and LNG as kind of a, a managed decline. They're not very busy at Shell headquarters. They haven't done much, but that's actually a good thing by default. Here we can see their renewables capacity and they're not even at a gigawatt yet, hardly. When we look at their LNG regasification terminals, they're actually mainly in the US um, with quite a bit in the UK. Um, that's actually not good strategically. When you compare them to Total Energies, most of Total Energies LNG regasification is based in Europe uh, with a lot less in the US. That's where the real money is to be made because because there's no gas coming from Russia anymore, 
the um, the European countries are desperately relying on liquefied natural gas with what regasification terminals there are in Europe. So total energies are really are in the sweet spot in terms of their LNG strategy, whereas actually um, most of Shell's LNG regasification plants are in the US when actually LNG is leaving the US more, not going to the US. The, uh, the US Henry Hub gas price is up a bit. So no way as good as the European situation here with the green line, but still, but still, they do make more money. Strategically, the LNG is in the wrong place compared with Total Energies, who are really are in the sweet spot. Uh, looking at the upstream, which is oil and gas exploration, production, transport and marketing, they went through this 30 billion divestment program, and this really shows how you know, although they've obviously maintained their refining and production capacity, which is great, you know, for oil and gas, which is great because um, that allows them to make loads of money in the coming years from higher gas and oil prices, and particularly refined oil prices, as we'll come to. In the case of their actual uh, hydrocarbon reserves, they, they're starting to looking they're starting to look rather diminished. And as they've said, um, they're only going to diminish those more by fifteen percent to twenty thirty. But they've still got plenty enough to keep um, to keep up with the hydrocarbon production, which you can see here, and still make the same kind of money in coming years even though that's from a lower resource base. Um, you see a dip in their gas, which is from selling their, their shale. But I guess in longer term, they're, they're exchanging the, the shale with their Canadian gas, as, gas resources that they bought. But that doesn't come online until 2025. Uh, this red line here, that's where if you take away the Russian hydrocarbon reserves, um, a lot of that is gas. And then when you take that away, that's where the gas will be when you take away Russia. So a drop, but still quite survivable. Now moving to, on to oil products, which is uh, their crude oil refineries. So it's turning that crude oil into distillate products. That's uh, the refined, that's actually the petrol they sell at their service stations. Plus, though, they sell a lot of refined products to other people as well. Now, also, they throw in EV charge points in as their, into their oil product segment. And that's where, at the service stations, they're starting to make money from people with EV cars who want to charge up there. But that's actually a minimal drop in the ocean, actually, in terms of their oil products revenue. Now, when we look at their shelf... Shell refinery throughput and and capacity, we see unfortunately a drop in their capacity by about a third in the last few years, and their throughput going down as well. Now a lot of that is from divestment, but a lot of that is also because they've actually been not been operating these um, refineries so at full belt because of the lower refining margins. I'll dig into that a bit more later. Uh, and we see their oil product sales down as well. And in terms of their chemicals, you know, kind of managed decline again is the general theme of this company. But now I'll come into the numbers. So when we look at the profit and loss profile, we see it was kind of jumping around a bit just as the oil price jumped around a bit. But then after COVID, when it, when their actual net income actually went negative, they bounced back. But even though the price of uh, crude oils jumped up and Henry Hub up massively, as I showed earlier, their sales haven't jumped up the same amount. And when I looked into it, um, this was mainly because their their focus on refined products rather than just selling crude oil. 
we can see here in this breakdown uh, the oil products is way but down compared with pre-COVID despite the high oil prices so you can see it even more in this breakdown now when you look in their numbers uh, broken up by segment we see here how a lot of their upstream they just sell to themselves it's into segments so that's selling to themselves we see that for upstream the revenues are kind of similar if you look at 2019 with 221 but then when you look at the breakdown for for oil products which are their refined products you see we see actually a big drop in their revenues and that's because they're selling to third parties and their oil refining their refining margins are down so their sales actually dropped from 2019 to 2021 because of these lower refining margins you know so they made some good revenues from their upstream and integrated gas so when we look at net income in by business segment we see how we see how their uh, oil product sales was much lower in 21 compared with 2019 because of the lower refining margins and so the only reason why they had a good year was because the higher oil price they benefited from that even though it's not their focus and of course from higher gas prices that's the uh, orange line here that did well as well but their main focus is in refined products which is was suffering but the great news is, is that if we look at refining margins we see that here they are in the historic lows then in 2022 this year they've just absolutely ballooned i mean they're up um, according to this data they're up fourfold so that's amazing and here's shell's first quarter 2022 update and we see here they show that their ref refining margins are now up at uh, ten dollars a barrel and that's a massive increase from the first quarter 2021 i mean it's double your kind of average last year and like a fivefold increase probably from around 2020 so this is where i'm getting very excited about shell because their main their historically their main money driver was the uh, refined products which was doled in 2021 because of poor refining margins they still kind of did okay the other areas made up for it now we've got these supercharged refined product sales which is then gonna we're gonna see severe growth here in this business segment of their oil product in their oil product business segment you add that to these already elevated segments of for the money they're making from gas and uh, just crude oil and it's their sales are looking amazing for shell in 2022 even more so than your typical oil stock and this is why this i think explains why from the first quarter of 2022 the uh, share price for, for shell has been on this much more assertive traject trajectory than with its peers total energies and bp who are up who are up as well but with less certainty and i think that's down to the fact that shell's fortunes are a lot more focused on refined product sales okay looking at assets and debt and it's a fairly steady signature in terms of their assets and debt across the years uh, one thing that's generally notable is a lot of their assets are real assets um, as you'd kind of expect from a commodities company but but it's just good to point out when we look at the breakdown in assets it's all real stuff you know 37 billion of cash 78 billion of oil in oil tankers ready to ship and also in accounts receivable so that's oils oil that they've already sold they're just waiting for the money for 118 billion in their production assets which i 
I make to be the uh, their actual oil and gas license areas and all of the the capex on that in order to deliver those resources 70 billion in supply related plant property and equipment the vast majority of their assets are real assets now marked against that you know i don't like their 81 billion in debt although it is usual for commodities companies to carry a lot of debt i still kind of don't like it and it's interesting to note the increase in hedging here and um you know which adds to the debt overall so they've got 229 billion in liabilities and we can see that visually laid off against their uh, their assets and that leaves them with a price to book ratio of 1.2 when you look at their market cap here of 215 billion so they're still um you know not you know very nicely valued i'd say and when i look at their equity and valuation profile we see that their you know their market cap is still very reasonably placed versus their actual assets and when you look at overall trends that's kind of a good place to be in uh where they're moving away from their net assets rather than closer towards it um and yeah so apart from the you know the high debt i'm fairly happy with that visualization there so um i do this plot of price to book versus price to earnings and we see that of all the commodity stocks shell have the most attractive price to book so that's good the exception being for expo but they're obviously based they're based in ukraine which is why they have such a low price to book value but other than that, yeah, Shell are the, have got the most attractive price to book value. The most expensive price to earnings, though, of the oil stocks, but still, you know, looks fairly reasonable. So on to the consolidated statement of cash flows. And Shell are bringing in 45 billion in operating from operating activities and 15 billion for their disposals. Up against that, they had to spend 20 billion on capex, 7 billion on dividends, 20 billion paying off debt, and 4 billion paying interest on the debt they have, as well as 1.2 billion on derivatives costs. They lost half a billion due to FX effects, and they spent 3 billion returning money back to shareholders by share buybacks. So overall, that made, that meant they made, after all that, a five billion cash gain in 2021. And I have to say, this is a very, very healthy statement of cash flows. If you remember that cash draw GTX advert, where they had that computer model of a beautifully running engine, just a perfectly running engine, running cash draw GTX, that's how healthy this statement of cash flows is. And when I take away the things they don't have to do, they'd have a 13 billion cash gain. So I took a look at the shareholder breakdown and only BlackRock and Norges Bank have enough shares to show up on the radar. I can't really read much into it more than that. What is really interesting though, is when you look how historically they had more big lads in there and how they all totally fled shell in 2019 that's really interesting to me because that fits the narrative of when i did the greta gold series where all the big money controllers they ran away from oil stocks like they were the plague and as you can see all went in into this all these different renewable stocks most of which are just total junk and i find it interesting that now all of a sudden we've got people buying big money asset managers buying into shell again as if they've gone back into fashion again now that we're in energy crisis and the world suddenly realized that oh actually we do need energy in order to run modern civilizations 
as a basic principle. So um, here's my sector analysis. And actually, I only started doing sector analyses this year properly. And it's now, to me, actually a key tool. Um, and moving forward, I'll probably be doing the sector analysis first and actually not bothering to go into detail in stocks unless it looks right from the the sector chart analysis in the first place. In terms of oil and gas, it's kind of a neutral at the moment. It fits, the sector analysis fits my narrative of everyone was running away from uh, oil stocks like they were the plague. And then now, you know, because of all these ESG considerations and that as well. And now there's an energy crisis and now all the people with the money in these big asset funds are, are rushing into uh, oil stocks again. And based on my expectation of high oil prices for quite a few years, you know, I expect this, this sector trend to continue. And then maybe there's like a longer term sector trend where uh, oil is a commodities and commodities generally just go up in value a bit um, along with inflation uh, because the actual amount invested in all commodity stocks um, you know the, the valuations of those stocks is never much more the price to ne is never much more than the price to book generally for commodity stocks so so you generally get like a, a linear line up just that we had this special situation of ESG and environmental madness that caused this disjunction and now we're recovering from that back up to the longer term trend line you know that's the best case for uh, this sector the worst case could be you know, we have a, a more general stock crash and so oil go down and the general trend is down. But, you know, I can't predict that, but I can build kind of best case and worst case models for each sector and use this as a guide to whether it's going in or not. Oil and gas, I'd say this is more like a neutral placing in terms of just a sector analysis what i find really interesting is when you now look these are all different sectors and they're different profiles so why is it that when different sectors all these different profiles when you when you look at oil and gas and then look at banks and then look at aerospace and defense industries the sector analysis for those three sectors match absolutely perfectly. I mean, isn't that astounding? What is it about defense companies and war and evil bankers that aligns perfectly with oil and gas industry? I mean, for me, you know, that is a clear data signal and there's got to be a profound reason to that, which I find very interesting. If anyone thinks how they correlate, please do post your what your thoughts in the comments section. But for me, there's something very profound going on there. Yeah, I'll just mention while I'm here, and even though it is a distraction, um, a couple of other general insights I had when I was looking at the different sectors so pharmaceuticals and biotechnology, um, I believe strongly in the long term, we're going to see this increased linear trend, uptrend in pharma and biotech. The reason is, is that the world population is continually getting older and richer. And as the because of modern science and because of healthcare, the um, the world population gets older more people are getting ill with treatable diseases. So you've got this um, self-reinforcing industry that can only make more and more money as people get healthier. And then because they get healthier, there's more people getting iller with cancer and things that you only get when you get older. 
So for me, there's definitely a, it makes sense that for the pharma sector, for it to just be linear up, up, up. However, in the short term, you know, we're kind of the wrong end of the, this channel here, but um, I'm definitely now going to be monitoring this sector. And when we get back down here, I'll definitely be doing a, um, a stock filter on pharma stocks. And then when we look at uh, food, pro food producers and processors, we see there is in the long term a down, a quite a clear downward trend. And that, again, there's a clear reason for me for that, which is because of modern technology, uh, the price of food just has been going down and down and down. Uh, because, you know, because of modern farming, agriculture, and then modern food processing, it just gets cheaper. We know that actually we're looking at a food crisis happening next year. So we expect, you know, presumably if, you know, you've got, say, one million capex in a sausage factory um, and because of inflation and a food crisis, the value of those sausages is going to go up tenfold because of a food crisis then the uh, return on capex you can get from your set 1 million of uh, sausage factory, uh, then obviously you'd expect the um, maybe these food producers are going to go up in value in the next few years because of this food crisis. But, <clears throat> but after that, you know, for me, the general trend is down for this particular sector. And you'd want to wait till you're at the bottom before daring to go in. But I'd actually rather go for sectors where the general trend is up and then try and pick the bottom of the channel there than the other way around. So again, I couldn't resist again uh, going off piste. So sorry about that. But I find this uh, sector analysis, you know, a very, very good um new pillar for me to add to my investment toolkit and uh, I've gone in a lot more detail there in future videos though I'll be doing a sector analysis for each stock but just focusing on the sector that that particular uh, share, share that I'm covering is involved with but in terms of uh, Shell I say that the sector analysis for Shell is kind of neutral at the moment. Okay, so for me, Shell are definitely a buy. I have to say, though, that please remember that, I mean, this is my portfolio at the moment, and I'm only 27% in shares, including Shell. So what I'd say is they're definitely a buy, but only a buy if you're less than 30% in shares. If I already had like more than that in shares, I wouldn't be buying anything, I promise you, uh, because generally the situation is very risky at the moment. Um, also, please, um, please do remember that I'm just a total amateur. I'm, I've got no financial qualifications, so you need to do your own research and seek an investment advisor. But in terms of this, um, in terms of me, for my own situation, I do regard Shell a, a buy. And what's been particularly exciting for me is how I've seen how Shell are particularly exposed to oil refining, to oil refining margins. And the fact that um, refining margins have just exploded to the upside in 2022, this explains uh, why Shell are so hot. But but the you know the upside for Shell in relation to their peers is nothing compared with actually how refining margins have shot up. And so out of all the oil stocks. This makes oil. This makes Shell particularly exciting. Plus, on top of that, they've got minimal Russian ex exposure. So, Shell are clearly the best of the oil stocks, and all from all and all by default, all from having crappy management that haven't actually done anything. That's the amazing thing here. But by default, 
they're in the best position as of all the old stocks. You've got to remember that, uh, you know, the buying shell is based on long term increases in oil price because of the oil crisis. And you've got to bear in mind that they particularly are linked to uh, to refining margins. And then in terms of risks, oil price is um, the, the, the main risk. Although elevated oil prices are going to be great if you hold shell, remember that if there is a big global recession, that will send oil price tumbling too and is a risk. Finally, um, for me, um, all of this trapping of CO2 in the North Sea, which they're doing as part of being carbon neutral, that to me is actually um, a, ri a risk. I don't think it's a very clever idea to be trapping carbon dioxide, you know, millions of tonnes of it under the North Sea, because if some of that escaped, um, you'd have like, you'd be turning the North Sea into a Bermuda Triangle where ships can just suddenly get sunk um, in massive underwater uh, gas bubbles. So for me, that's a risk. Now, according to all the experts, that's very low likely to happen. So it's kind of very, very, very low likelihood to happen. But if it did happen, it'd be a disaster. But it catches my imagination. So I put that in there as a risk. But other than that, that's it. You know, this quarterly, the first quarter report that Shell brought out, where they've got their refining margins here, I think that Shell are really exciting. And I'll leave it there. I hope you've enjoyed the video. And I wish you all the best with your own investment choices. And have a good week.